So this kind of ties into my nutrition LP that we'll go over at the very end. First thing we address is protein. When somebody walks in and they want to lift, they typically have heard somewhere that eating more protein than they're used to eating is involved in that process. This is probably the most common macronutrient talked about in you know, gyms across the world. We can all agree that you need to eat more protein if you're going to lift weights. So the word protein originates from proteos, means first order, which is also the first priority here, so it kind of works out that way. That's not why I did it, but you know, people knew this way back when. It uh, has a lot of roles in physiology. It's not just you know, the grams of protein on a food label. We have plenty of proteins in the human body. And you know, kind of put that in your head right now. We have lots and lots of proteins in the human body. Um, they're, broke, they're made up of amino acids. So there's 20 amino acids that make up protein. There's essential and non-essential, and I'll explain that as well. And there's your table. You have your essential amino acids, which means you have to get them from your diet. You, you're not gonna, your body's not going to manufacture these uh, natu on its own. Your non-essential amino acids, and I guess they're using the word dispensable, indispensable now. That might, they might come up with a new word in the next edition of whatever textbook you're looking at. Um, Non-essential means you can manufacture them in the human body. And then uh, conditionally essential means that they can become essential under certain conditions. You may need them from the diet if like, you're not manufacturing them naturally for a variety of different reasons. Then you have your branch chain amino acids, your BCAAs. Everybody, everybody needs to drink BCAAs. And they, they do everything, Rip. They, they, they cure chronic disease. They're going to put 50 pounds of muscle on you without lifting a weight. So there's three of them. There's leucine, valine, and isoleucine. I'm going to focus on leucine because that is the one that we hear about in gym situation. So I think this comes up in a different slide. So just kind of we'll come back to that. This is where I want to start, though. Muscle proteins are a type of protein in the human body. They account for 40%. So that means 60% of the proteins in your body are not muscle. They're not muscle proteins. So remember that. Muscles are 70% water, approximately. So about 30% of it is actual protein. After you lift, you break down the muscle, and then it has to rebuild. So protein breakdown increases, protein synthesis increases. They're both increasing at the same time, which makes sense. You just lifted, you broke down the muscle, it has to rebuild itself. Uh, hypertrophy is defined as the enlargement of muscle fibers. Hyperplasia is the addition of addition, or adding additional muscle fibers. So these are just some simple definitions to kind of remember. But the main thing you got to take away from this is there are more proteins in the human body than muscle proteins. How's that strapping young boy there? <laughs> um, so how do your muscles grow? You have to lift. You don't just go and buy BCAAs, put them in your gallon of water, drink them, and build muscle. It doesn't happen that way. If you gain a bunch of body weight, assuming you're not sedentary, a percentage of that's going to be muscle mass, obviously, but we're not talking about that situation. In general, you have to stimulate the muscle to grow. You have to lift. I think we're all covered there. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Um, in the long term, building larger, muscles, build, um, building larger muscles build stronger muscles and vice versa. You have to get stronger to build muscle. That has to happen. The weight on the bar has to go up. You have to get stronger. You might hear something else, somewhere else, but the more you look at it, the more you look at the data, the more you spend time in the gym, the more you lift, you kind of find this to be true. At a certain point, you cannot get bigger without getting stronger. We're not talking about the novice who comes in and is just learning how to move. There's a lot of neuromuscular stuff that happens there in the beginning, but the longer you're under the bar, you have to build stronger muscles to build larger muscles. So now the big one. Nutrition supplements your training. How you eat facilitates the adaptations to training. So you have to eat a certain way to build stronger muscles, to get stronger, to get bigger. Um, in other words, if you just sit there, 
put a whole container of Extends in your gallon of water and drink it, you're not just going to grow. It just doesn't work that way. You're not going to grow. Um, so yeah, weight on the bar has to go up. And now the big question. This is kind of where I was leading to with this. What about muscle protein synthesis? And I wish Will was talking about that article from the SSCA. <laughs> this is Will's favorite topic. Um, so, protein synthesis, synthesis of new proteins. Muscle, we're talking about muscle proteins, right? So, on a cellular level, obviously, if you add more muscle proteins, you would think that would correlate with hypertrophy, enlargement of muscles. This is kind of where the theory behind protein supplements come from. There's a little pathway in the human body called mTOR, and that's the pathway for protein synthesis. And that gets activated by a variety of different things, such as lifting. Lifting activates mTOR. You know what else activates mTOR? Leucine. So this is kind of where the whole BCAA thing originates from. They say if you take leucine, you're going to activate mTOR. If you activate mTOR, you're going to increase um, muscle protein synthesis. So then the thought there is if you increase muscle protein synthesis, you're going to get hypertrophy. I keep looking at Will and I want to laugh. <laughs> um, but, that it, but then when you start looking at the papers on this, it doesn't necessarily correlate. So I should kind of back up and say, tell you how this is measured. So they'll have somebody come into the gym. Not this gym, because we don't have a knee extension. We'll go to Gold's, hop on the knee extension, do 10 sets of 10 or something. So you'll do 10 sets of 10 knee extensions. Sorry, we can't do it here. Can't get a volunteer up here to try that. Um, and they'll infuse a tracer into the bloodstream. And this is kind of like, the way you want to think about this, it's like a tracking device. So they'll have this tracer that they can follow through the human body, and they can see um, the, um, it's called the, the difference in a specific amino acid in, the ar in their arteries and your veins. And that difference can tell you how much of it was incorporated into the actual tissue, right? So you'll do 10 sets of 10 knee extensions, they'll get a blood sample, then they'll determine your fractional synthetic rate. And that's how they determine protein synthesis, right? What's the problem with this, though, other than the fact that it's very uncomfortable? It's a single point in time. You're going to come one time. You're going to do 10 sets of 10. I'm going to, which is a novel stress because most of us aren't doing 10 sets of 10 already. So it's a novel stress. We're going to take your blood. We're going to send you home, and then we're going to say, hey, there's been an increase in protein synthesis and protein breakdown after 10 sets of 10 for a guy who hasn't been doing 10 sets of 10. So they've addressed this by saying, oh, let's do a familiarization session where you'll practice that a few times and then we'll do it. Again, so you've done it three times. How long does it take to build muscle? Do you get bigger after three sessions? Aside from swelling or getting a pump, do you, you know, does your whole body change after three sessions? No, you need to train three, five, three, four, five, six months, right? So if I get a blood sample from a single time point and I say, oh, your protein synthesis went up after a training session, therefore you're going to gain muscle, well, what happens if you didn't eat the rest of the day, right? So the next thing that they do is they'll add a supplement in. They'll say, hey, we're going to have you do 10 sets of 10, and then we're going to have you take BCAAs or take whey protein right after or take casein. You know, it depends what question they're trying to answer. They, they've done studies where they compare different types of protein to each other, and they've just done studies where it was a protocol and they gave protein. And what they found is when you take a whey protein supplement after doing 10 sets of 10 and giving a blood sample, your fractional synthetic rates increase. But does that mean you're going to get hypertrophy? You would think. It sounds good on paper, but you know, you're trying to make a guess based on one time point about what's going to happen after, let's, let's say, three months, so 12 times 3, 36 sessions, right? And what typically happens when you apply stress more times, you adapt to it. The, the effect is not as pronounced. You get better at handling that stress, right? So if you really wanted to look at this, you'd have to you know, run the whole tracer study every single session for 36 sessions to see, okay, this is what we saw in terms of protein synthesis, and this is what we saw in terms of lean mass, because that's how you measure, that's one way to measure if somebody's gained muscle, you're looking at lean mass. So lean mass means everything that's not body fat. Every, so it could be water, organs, etc. If that changes, you can be pretty confident that most of that is going to be water and muscle mass. You're going to deposit more glycogen, store more body water, and gain muscle mass. So this is the most common way that 
changes in muscular body weight are assessed is through lean mass. So now, uh, this second to last point is where we want to go. These fractional synthetic rates that are measured at a single time point don't correlate with changes in lean mass. Let's say you're sleep deprived and you're trying to train sleep deprived, but you're taking your whey protein. You might still see this same spike after your 10 sets of 10 on two hours sleep, but then are you going to increase lean body mass over a 12 week period? Not necessarily. So again, this is why these claims with BCAAs and whey are kind of a little bit of an overreach is what I'm kind of getting at. So if you're not training and you're, you know, if you're going into the gym and doing 225 every single time, but you're taking your whey protein, you're not going to grow. And if you have clients that are doing that, they're not going to grow. So you got to make sure you explain this because it's kind of marketed as, oh, you have to take whey protein if you're lifting weights. Because if you don't take whey protein, especially within an hour of exercise, you're not going to grow. The last point, and this is because when I'm on the boards, especially not lately, but when I first got on the boards a couple years ago, every other question was, I want to increase my muscle protein synthesis. What do I do? Are we going to the gym to increase muscle protein synthesis? Or are we going to the gym to get bigger and stronger? Right? So just kind of put it into context. I haven't taken whey protein on a continuous basis in 17 years. <laughs> I mean, I've consumed it periodically, but I don't I'm real bad at taking pills and powders, so I can never live the bro life of having the pill container and the gallon jug and all that stuff, but I just eat. I'm not saying that everybody needs to do that. There's a place for whey protein. If you're having trouble eating it all, then yeah, take it. It's a supplement. That's what it's there for, you know? It's not a substitute. So we've all heard about protein quality. I'm not going to go into all the detailed math about all these metrics because what you're going to find out when you're looking at all these different scales is the foods are pretty much ranked exactly the same. It kind of falls like this. So whey is considered the highest quality protein. And the reason why is because it's the most bioavailable. You're getting all your essential amino acids from it in very high concentrations and you're absorbing most of that. And casein and egg, sometimes you'll see egg above casein, sometimes you'll see casein above egg, depending on which scale you're looking at. But basically, whey, egg, and dairy are your highest forms. And then you got beef, and then you got chicken, poultry, and then vegetable proteins tend to be way at the bottom. So then what about vegetarians? Because I get a lot of those now. Well, there are more products available for vegetarians in 2019 than ever. You got a lot of this meatless stuff out there that some of it's not completely terrible. I mean, I don't I wouldn't replace my, my beef with it, but I've eaten it just to try it because I get questions and you cannot answer questions until you've experienced it yourself. So I've had to go and try the impossible stuff over at Kidoba and corn with a QU, eating all that stuff. Yeah. Corn. Yeah. 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 But all the weird fake meats, I've tried most of them. And if I, if I haven't, send it to me and I'll try it. Got to be your own guinea pig. Um, the thing about vegetable proteins and plant-based proteins is you have to eat more of them because they're, they don't have as many of the amino acids in them. And then you also run into the problem of fiber. So fiber interferes with protein absorption. And what are vegetables high in? They're high in fiber. Like, so beans. Beans have a lot of protein in them, but beans have a lot of fiber in them. So you don't absorb as much of that protein because you're getting all that fiber. That does not mean go on a low-fiber diet. Yeah, so those are the two, those are the two problems with vegetarian diets and protein intake is you have to eat more of it because of the fiber and the lower amino acid content. Um, one thing they kind of got wrong is you often hear that, oh, it's, you know, there's not a lot of leucine in these plant-based foods. It's not typically leucine that's the limiting amino acid. It's usually the sulfur-containing amino acids, so cysteine and methionine tend to be lower in plant-based foods. That being said, you're not getting quite as much leucine as you would from a piece of beef, but it's usually the sulfur-based uh, sulfur-containing amino acids that tend to be lower in plant-based proteins. Like I said, there are so many options. Vegetarians no longer have an excuse to not get enough protein. There are so many options now. They got protein chips, they got all these plant-based proteins that are with amino acids added to them. Uh, powders like pea protein. It's not just soy anymore, you know. Uh, pea, hemp. Hemp's a complete protein too, by the way. It has very, very bioavailable. I just learned this has a complete amino acid profile in it. Um, so how much should you eat? So we have different uh, reference ranges that you know, our government has established for us. So we have our daily re dietary reference intake, 
So that estimates nutrient intakes for planning and assessing diets of healthy individuals. So we're not even talking about trained populations yet. Then you have your EAR, so that's your estimated uh, average requirement, so this means that it meets the needs of half the population, which means that it does not meet the needs of the other half. Then you have your RDA, which depends on the EAR. If there's no EAR, you're not going to have an RDA. And uh, the RDA is set at the EAR plus twice the standard deviation if there's a standard deviation known. So I'm explaining all this because I'm going to bring these terms up as we go along. Um, so the average daily dietary intake level that is sufficient to meet nutrient requirements of nearly all, so about 98% of people, the RDA should meet the needs of 98% of untrained people. That's kind of the takeaway there. So for protein, remember, untrained. You're, not, you're sitting on the couch. You're not doing anything. Uh, 0.66 grams per kilogram, so not very much. The RDA is 0.8 grams per kilogram, and this is for men over 18 and women over the age of 14. Um, again, no training. So if you're lifting, you're going to need more than this. If you're a vegetarian, you're going to need more than this because of what I just explained. All right, so am I going to tell you how much yet? So since we're in the metric system, I'm going to stay in the metric system and say about 2.2 grams per kilogram is probably a good place to start for most people. You could probably maintain on that. You could probably gain muscle on that. So it's a gram per pound if we're going to use American units. Um, the same is likely sufficient for older adults. So a lot of the, well, before I even start talking about nutrition research, what we got to know is 99% of it is bullshit because you can't actually measure what people are eating. So I'm going to keep coming back to that as we go along. But when you start looking at research papers on uh, <coughs> protein, they found that in older adults, it's you know less than this. Like they're looking at 1.7 grams per kilo and they've seen you know muscle gain there with silly protocols. They're not doing what we're doing here, but um, you know the one gram per pound is pretty good for most people. You're, most of us are probably overshooting there, and that's fine. And you can go higher than that and still be fine. Um, so it will generally amount to about 150 grams per day to 250 grams per day for most men, and about 100 to 150 for most women. Some may need higher than this. Some may need lower than this. It just really depends, but. That's a good range to start with, and if you start like plugging these numbers in, you're going to fall somewhere in between that. Now, what if you're 350 pounds and obese? Well, you're not going to need 350 grams of protein. You know, you just kind of assume what a normal weight would look like for you and kind of go off that. What about... Yeah, and the goal weight shouldn't be 9% body fat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, when I say that, you know, if you're 350 pounds and you'd be at a normal body weight at 200 or 220, then 200 to 220 is probably fine. Yeah. That guy doesn't need 350 grams of protein. But is that going to blow out his kidneys? No, and that's, that's a different slide. <laughs> so how often? So this, this, this um, frequency question comes up too because we're back to muscle protein synthesis, right? So if you eat every two hours, you get a more consistent rise in it, then you get these people that say, oh, you're not going to absorb 100 grams of protein in one sitting. So if you're not going to absorb it, what happens to it? First of all, is that statement true? If, I, if you eat 16-ounce steak, are you just going to not absorb that protein? Exactly. <laughs> it's going somewhere. Um, it's not a very good energy source, but what did I say earlier about proteins in the human body? The majority of it is used for other stuff. The majority of it is used for other stuff. 60% of the proteins in your body aren't even muscle proteins. So what they're actually saying is, okay, you're only using about 20 to 50 grams of protein that you eat for muscle protein synthesis, which is measured by fractional synthetic rates and things that really don't matter for our purposes, right? But the rest of it's still getting used to create other body proteins. Everybody clear on that? So, you know, if you eat 200 grams of protein in one sitting, you're not going to feel good, but it doesn't mean you're going to not absorb it. You're still going to digest and absorb all that protein. It's, it's all getting used. It's, it's getting used. Not, the way that... not for building muscle necessarily, you know. So the idea is they say you should eat about 20 to 50 grams every three to five hours. You're going to absorb and digest 100% of it. So before I finish this up, I just remembered that I didn't really talk about types of protein powders because I know you're going to get questions on that or some of you might have questions on that. So like whey is 
typically what is recommended for somebody to take when they've worked out because of what I just explained. It's supposedly going to increase your muscle protein synthesis, blah, blah, blah. I just say it because you're hungry. Take away protein shake, goes down easy. You know, it's not real viscous. And you can mix it with anything if you get it unflavored. Um, if you're going to use it as a meal replacement and you want to get full, but you don't want to necessarily cook a steak when you're on the run in the middle of the day, you know, casein or an egg white protein is pretty good because this tends to be a more slower digesting protein. It has a little more viscosity to it. Um, I think it tastes fine. So, you know, your palate's going to really determine that and also how well you tolerate it. So I have a lot of people that complain that casein protein, is they don't tolerate it well. They, you know, get gas or bloating or various things. So it's really going to depend on the person. But I think that casein or egg white protein is probably a better meal replacement than whey. But then you can also mix whey with other things. So if you're mixing it with peanut butter and, you know, maybe adding some flaxseed in there or making a fruit smoothie, you're going to get a little fuller from that. So it doesn't mean that, hey, whey is a bad meal replacement. Some people take it that way. It's not that it's a bad meal replacement. If you're just taking whey with water, it's not very filling. That's all that means. You start adding milk. So now you're adding casein from the milk. And if you're getting like a 2% or a whole milk, you're now adding fat. So you're going to feel a little fuller from that way if it's mixed with those other things. Everybody kind of clear on that?